he uses three images or figures in order to give the Trinitarian character of God as both one but distinct. Mm -hmm. right? And one of them is, in fact, the fountain, mm. where you have the fountain, the source, the arche, the headwater, if you will. Mm -hmm. That would be the Father. Then you have the stream or the river which flows out of it. Later on, the church would use language like begotten from the Father or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have the refreshment mm -hmm. or the coolness that one receives by way of the stream or the water. That's the spirit, right? Yeah, that's okay. beautiful. Blessings to you and your family. Today's episode is a special episode. It's an interview with Dr. William Weinreich, who has a lot of notabilities, but maybe most notably, he is a world-renowned expert on the book of John and also on understanding the earliest church. In other words, the first three, 400 years of the church and what they were experiencing, what they understood theologically, and how that affected their Christian life. In today's episode, you'll hear him explain what that looks like and how that is particularly important for how we understand the church in our Christian life in today's society. Also, you'll be able to hear some insights into the book of John that has always blown my mind and uh, really helped me grow theologically, intellectually, and in my life. So I'm very excited to be able to share his wisdom with you today. Also, two quick things. One, if you can simply take three seconds and click that like button, it is amazing how much that changes the YouTube algorithms so that this video will be seen by more and more people. So. If you think that Dr. William Weinreich's message is good for people to see, take the three seconds and click that like button, and it will help that tremendously. Second, we're always looking for feedback for questions that you want answered. Uh, simply put that in the comments below. We will read that, and we take that into consideration as we plan future episodes. So thank you, enjoy, and God bless. All right, and we're live. Okay. Professor Dr. William Weinrich. Welcome to the show. This is a great honor to sit down with you. Well, it's a great honor to be here, Brian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and we were just talking about this, but I think I'll probably end up naturally referring to you as professor throughout. It's fine. And it's, you just, you were my professor. Yep. And I, now I've sat through a couple even continue ed classes with yep. you, but whenever I come come into contact with you, I always just think professor. That's how you're cemented in my mind. Well, that's that's fine with me. I've been that for many years, and so you can call me anything, but professor is great. Okay, sounds good. Um, do you want to just say kind of one thing for the audience that's listening? Uh, do you remember uh, Doc Mason or Justin Mason? He was a classmate oh, yeah, Justin of Justin Mason. He's down in Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good friend too. I really, yeah. really appreciate him. But I remember when we were here. I think it was maybe our fourth year or so. Um, if you remember, Josh Arndt and I, uh, you were, you were doing an evening talk of some sort. Okay. And so classes were done and everything. I think it was a Friday. And um, Doc came up, Justin came up, and he said, oh, are you guys going to the Weinrich talk? And we were kind of on the fence at the point. We're like, oh, I don't know. Like, it's Friday night, da, 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 da. And I remember what he said. He said, uh, he's like, not that long ago, people used to travel for days and weeks and months in order to go find somebody who was a world expert on something. If they could just go sit and listen to them for a couple hours. That was, a, that was not easily accessible, right? Because there's only a couple people in the world that are world experts on important matters. And they're not in your backyard and you don't have the internet in order to access them. So I remember he said that and he, he kind of converted us to going and, <laughs> and to the lecture. And it was a great lecture, of course. But I just want to point that out for those that are watching this, just to, just to point out maybe two things. One, you might not say it, but I can certainly say it. You're certainly one of the world experts on the Gospel of John, which is maybe one of the most theologically potent books in the Bible if you want to understand you know, what the Bible is driving towards, what the Bible wants you to understand. So you're one of the world experts on this. And one of the goals of this podcast is specifically for something like this, where someone might be driving in their car, they might be sitting at home, but they now have access to sit here and listen to you for two and a half hours expound on this. So, yeah. um, Well, your listeners should know that Justin was a fan, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think he set the bar a little high. I don't know if I'm a world expert or not, but I've been engaged with this gospel since, oh, I mean, I'm writing a commentary on it, mm -hmm. a project <laughs> that I started way back in 1995. So it, I have been a little obsessed with this mm -hmm. particular book of the Bible for sure. 
But uh, but anyway, it's good to hear Justin Mason's name again. He was a great trombone player. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but maybe I can live up to his expectations with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very much looking forward to this every time we get to, uh, I get to hear you speak on John. It's great. So, uh, and we talked about this a little bit, so we're gonna we're gonna definitely dive into John, okay. so that you know you can speak on on that. As you said, what are we looking at? Twenty five, twenty seven years. You've been just yeah. just deep into John, um, but maybe just to kind of set the stage, your your main focus for your doctorate's degree originally was on the patristics, right? Yes, it was. What what are the patristics, and can you kind of explain what why that's important for the study of John? Yeah, it's a good question. <clears throat> Um, when I went to the University of Oklahoma, which I did, I wanted to be a heart surgeon originally, but I did go then to St. Louis Seminary, Concordia St. Louis, and got converted, if you will, to early church patristic studies by Herbert Mayer, the professor down there at the time. And uh, as I continued to read, uh, I was influenced by a Lutheran scholar by the name of Werner Ehlert, well-known mm-hmm. 20th century Lutheran scholar, but also an English patristic scholar by the name of J.N.D. Kelly. What I liked about both of those was that they, they wanted to integrate, and they were good at participating in both New Testament studies or biblical studies and patristic studies. Mm -hmm. That is to say the study of the early fathers. That's Mm -hmm. what patristics really is. And so I I kind of always had that idea to be put in both camps. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the University of Basel way back in 1968 and then for my doctor's degree in 1972, I studied under a man by the name of Oscar Coleman, and he always told me that if you wanted to be a good New Testament man, you needed to know patristics, Mm -hmm. and if you wanted to be a good patristic scholar, you needed to know the New Testament. And so that kind of reinforced my my desire to kind of be in both camps, Mm -hmm. but my fundamental interest way back when I was a young man was history. So I kind of moved more in the patristic area than I did New Testament. But my PhD or THD thesis was on early Christian martyr texts. Mm -hmm. And I did background material, Old Testament martyr texts like the Ascension of Isaiah, the martyrdom of Isaiah, the Maccabean literature, which comes from the second century BC and so forth, New Testament materials on martyrdom and the Holy Spirit, First Peter loomed large there, for example, obviously Jesus' passion account, Paul's account of himself as a suffering apostle, And then I moved on through to Tertullian, a North African writer, dated around 230 or so. Uh, So so I I began then really on the patristic side of things. And then I was called here to this seminary where I taught patristics uh, really until roughly 206 when I briefly left for a while. and now I'm really mostly in New Testament here. But you ask about patristics, what it is, and why it might be important to look at that. Again, patristics is the discipline of studying the early church fathers, but the early church more generally. There tends to be no real time frame here. Usually one thinks until about six or 700 or so, and in which case the Middle Ages takes over, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do think, and I have for a long time thought, that patristics is extremely important for us now, even as Lutherans, to kind of recapture a little bit. There's always been kind of a side pocket um, in in Lutheran scholarship, and I notice this even today, where patristics are appreciated, 
but sometimes perhaps not as integrated into our thinking as they could be and should be. Mm -hmm. And why should I say that? I Maybe you remember, because I had you in early church. Did I not? Did I have you in early church? Oh, I was there no, maybe Sean. maybe I was... I did. We took Augustine. Oh, okay. So we you, took you a, had Augustine with me. Okay. Augustine. Well, when I taught early church history for many years, I would always tell the students that our present time is much more like the early churches, especially before, say, 300. Mm-hmm then our time is like the Reformation period. Because what Luther had in common with his opponents, whether they be Swingley or whether they be the Pope, they all believed in the Trinity. They all believed in the deity of Christ. They all believed, at least the papacy, the Catholic side, baptismal regeneration, Mm -hmm. infant baptism, the the real presence of the Eucharist. I mean, there was an incredible spectrum of beliefs that Luther could count on. Our day is not like that at all. Uh, And and again, back in the 16th century, who was not a Christian? I mean, Mm -hmm. it was the dominant faith. It governed civic as well as religious discourse, law, public habit, all of those kinds of things. None of that is true today. Uh, Today, Christianity is a distinctly minority faith, uh, increasingly minority faith, increasingly even rejected consciously, just not people just not being not Christian, but they don't like Christians. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain hostility towards Christianity today uh, the common calling of us as bigots or homophobes or whatever it may be. Well, that's very much like the Christian experience in the first three centuries. Uh, and so it's helpful perhaps for us to just attend to those first three centuries. I, uh, let me focus on that for a moment. And how did they, how did they articulate their beliefs and their disciplines, their habits, to a broader society that was oftentimes ignorant of them, Mm -hmm. sometimes knowing of them, but hostile to them, or skeptical of them, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And so that's one thing I think we can learn from the Patricians. How did they manage being a minority faith And this is also very important. The surrounding culture of the earliest Christians had no clue what Christianity was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Today, people think they know what Christianity does. There's a certain kind of backwater, kind of a, a faint memory, if you will, of what Christianity was and is. And... But back then, not. And increasingly, that's the case here, too. People just don't know what Christianity is. They, they have no clue what it is. They, uh, and so how do you speak Christianity, uh, live Christianity, to articulate it in a culture which simply doesn't know what you are about? Mm-hmm. Uh, So early Christian texts help us to kind of maybe think about that again more decisively than we are want to do. Uh, And, of course, the texts of martyrdom uh, are very insightful here, not just because they're texts of martyrdom, but the martyr texts are accounts of Christian experience uh, your your program is called On the Line, mm-hmm. right? The martyr was, strictly speaking, on the line mm-hmm. between death and life. And so they are texts which articulate the, the meaning of Christianity as a holistic experience, possession of God that must not be crossed into apostasy. 
Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a Christian in that moment, you have to articulate your faith. It has to be the whole of your life. The whole of your life, not just an opinion, Mm -hmm. but that which governs your life, defines your life, because your destiny lies in that faith. Mm -hmm. And I think Christianity today is kind of there. I don't mean that we're going to all be martyrs by no means, although that could happen. But, But we have to somehow find a way to begin to live a life that is not only suggestive, but actually demonstrates this kind of total commitment to Christ as Savior and Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to seem to our compatriots in our culture to be an incredibly radical position to take. So Christianity, I suspect, in coming years is going to seem to be extreme. Many people think it's extreme already. It's going to seem to be radical. For many, it's already radical. Well, that's how it was in the first three centuries, too. The Christians were accused of maestas, you know, that is to say, uh, against the Roman Imperium, which was seen as a good thing. It was keeping the peace. It was keeping order. It was providing law. It was providing economic prosperity. And here comes the Christians, Mm -hmm. right? Or they were accused of odium humani generis, the hatred of the human race, because they didn't worship the gods. They didn't give them proper obedience and, and honor, and therefore the gods might take it out on the world by way of famine or sickness or, what, or wars or whatever it may be. So, but uh, that's kind of where we are today. We're, we're kind of in that period again of the first three centuries where Christianity has to demonstrate truth Mm -hmm. by way of life as well as thought. Where do you think we are on the transition there? Because as you're speaking to that, I would say, well, you you can speak to this, but um, it seems like 30 years ago, you know, so certainly those that were being brought up 30 years ago, they didn't think that way. I do notice within my own generation, those, and it's a, it's less than it used to be, but those that are still Christian, I think they would, they would say amen to what you're saying. They wouldn't be shocked. However, they might, you might have to pull them 20% more in that direction to understand that. But where do you think we are in that transition? Well, it's a good question. I I don't know that there's a clear answer to it. Um, Let me just add another aspect to this. In a way we're in a more dire situation than the Christians were in the first three centuries. Uh, In the first three centuries, the Christians could count on the idea that there was truth, that there really was a natural law, whether it was understood according to the Stoic view or the Platonic or Aristotelian view, or just the Roman law, juristic notions, there was truth, there was an order that in some way was rooted in fact and reality. Mm -hmm. And so if you read the early Christian apologists, uh, they, they want to show how Christianity here and there was like Plato. Mm -hmm. Here or there was like the Stoics. Here or there was really like Aristotle so that they could say to the unbelieving world, see, you already have some notions that are really fulfilled in Christ if you just think about them rightly. Today, we are are kind of befuddled by a a nihilism. There is no, strictly speaking, there's no nature. There's no reality. Reality is self-constructed in some fashion, whether psychologically, emotively, or what have you. And oftentimes this nihilism is a solipsistic one. I determine my own reality. Mm -hmm. At this point, there's no common notions, right? 
There's no way in which we can appeal to them uh, to, to find a common idea or concept that Christians and they can endorse and we can build upon. And so how you articulate again Christian truth into this nihilistic world, that's something the early church really never had to face. So we're even, even more important, I think, will be the living out of Christian faith. Because it does seem to me that people in our generations do attend to experience. They attend to how someone actually lives mm -hmm. rather than ideas. Because in a sense, there is no true idea, mm -hmm. right? So everything has kind of gone to an existentialist mode, if you want. Uh, so that's, that's also very different. Would you say then that, I mean, as you say that, it makes me think, are we living in a time frame where we're seeing one of the worst philosophies take root? Well, I, I do think it's the worst because there's strictly speaking no philosophy out there, mm -hmm. right? The, the, that's kind of the point. The philosophy is that there is no philosophy. Everything is pure perspective. And so it's very difficult. I don't know of any time in the history of man, frankly, in which nihilism was actually a, an accepted understanding and perspective. Mm -hmm. It was always kind of seen as a philosophical possibility. Mm -hmm. that there was no reality, there was no truth or something like that. But we live in a time in which it's actually been adopted. Mm -hmm. Kind of, if you want to put a label to it, kind of a, a radical postmodernist notion that everything has devolved to perspective. Mm -hmm. There's no reality that confronts me to which I am obligated. And... And so, hence, there's no law. Law is in order to justify, to further promote my perspective. And so everything then comes down also then to power. We see this very much in our culture today. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's hard to know, but it's, uh, it seems to me that, in, in my view, this simply reinforces what I said a moment ago. It may be a period of time in which Christian life, as it were, speaks louder than Christian ideas or concepts. Mm -hmm. That seems really important. So as maybe one data point, well, maybe put it this way, um, there's those three transcendentals, right? There's the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I think for at least for myself, my instinct is normally to rely on the true, right? So I'm going to, let's, let's have a discussion about what's true. But to your point, you're saying the way the philosophy is built, common people around are not thinking in those terms. Right. But I do think you're right that they, people are though still attracted by the beautiful and the good, that right. which they can see and sense. Right. And a good data point is we have a school and we're getting a lot of people that are leaving the public sphere as far as education goes and coming to this private Lutheran school. Right. And they're not necessarily quite Christian, but they can still sense right. that there's something different that's more attractive. There's something ugly over here. There's something beautiful over here, and they're attracted to it. Right. And it's one of the discussions that we're having, and I see you kind of driving this point home, is 30 years ago, people really thought you could kind of marry the normal culture and the Christian thought and that these things are kind of going hand in hand with a little bit of a different nuance. But you're saying, for those listening, absolutely not. We're at a time where you have to understand that one is poison and that's what's what's given root in our culture and our thought mm -hmm. in our culture. For us, it has to look completely different. It's mm -hmm. not just a, a different a different small proclamation. Right, right. And if I could just kind of uh, add two or three just kind of uh, observations, comments. Uh, it is in, interesting to, to speak about the early church again that we are told in the book of Acts that the earliest Christians called themselves the way. Right? Mm. Uh, and this, of course, was first 
according to the book of Acts, the way they called themselves in the city of Antioch. But what's important there is that the way was hooked upon the Jewish notion of halakha, that is to say, how does one live according to the Torah? Hmm. So we, we kind of know that the earliest Christians defined themselves by way of a life, a, a set of disciplines and habits that were according to the law. Now, not the law of Israel, mm -hmm. not the law of Moses, but the new law, namely Jesus himself. And in fact, later on, we'll talk a little bit about the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John depicts Jesus as the will of God, the new Torah, the new way. He calls himself the way, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. So, so the earliest Christians actually thought of themselves as best defined by how they lived, not by what they thought. Mm -hmm. Now, corresponding to this is a, is a set of literature that is called protreptics. It's a Greek word which means to urge on, mm -hmm. to, to exhort. So a, a general in a fight, in a battle, might urge his soldiers on. That would be, the, the Greek verb would be protrepto, right? Mm. To urge on. So protreptics. What was protreptic literature? We see this very distinctively, say, in Justin Martyr's Apologies, the letter to Diognetus, a wonderful, beautiful second century piece of literature. Well, to your point, protreptics, first of all, would compare the, the patterns of life, the disciplines of life, and the habits of their surrounding pagan culture with the particular habits and disciplines of the Christian church. So we protect the marriage bed, for example. We do not mm -hmm. put out our children to, to prostitution or to slavery if we don't want them or, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. and, and that obviously only worked if there was a kind of a natural human law that was true to everyone. Right? Mm -hmm. If it was only specific to the Christian sensitivity, it would have no impact on the pagan. But they could appeal to the pagan on that basis because there was kind of a natural sense of good. Mm -hmm. right? And then the, this literature would explain why those habits and Christian disciplines exist. And by way of those lived out habits, they would introduce the notion of God. Mm -hmm. God is himself the one who behaves that way because he is, as he has revealed to us, especially in his son, the merciful, right? The, the, the one who is steadfast love, who is humble and all that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they went from life to to truth, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And you may have read, I, I, if I remember this correctly, you may have read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. If yes. I remember right, he begins, or someplace in that book, he wants to talk about common senses of what is good. And so he speaks, if you're on, I think, a trolley car or something like that, and suddenly you just punch somebody in the nose, yeah. there's this immediate reaction that that's not right. Mm -hmm. right? You're, and that's wrong yeah. for some reason. And if they're just kind of no, no, no moral imperative at all, then, then to feel aggrieved, you may feel aggrieved, but you have no reason to feel aggrieved. Mm -hmm. So... So yeah, there there is. I think uh, that we're in a time in which, to use your language, that the the virtue of the good has to be demonstrated again by Christian life. I might also say, given our observations of a few moments ago, our nihilistic culture 
is very good at producing victims. Mm -hmm. And we see this in the transgender issue where young people are sometimes um, led into very bad things, mm -hmm. taking hormone blockers and even uh, you know, uh, transition surgeries that scar them for life. Mm -hmm. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity that is going to be, and all, perhaps already is, for the church to show mercy to these people mm -hmm. and to to give them a sense of the dignity of their life, even within those kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, I think life is kind of the primary category for us, rather than truth. Again, that protreptic literature. You don't ignore truth, but you instantiate the meaning of your your existence, how you behave, your habits and disciplines, mm -hmm. by reference to a God who did in fact become man and demonstrated precisely those things which are good, true, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and frankly, the early church was very good at that. We have as I mentioned, this protriptic literature, which used to be called apologetics. Mm -hmm. But I, I note within the scholarly literature that they're kind of rethinking the titles or the category of that group of literature, not so much apologetics, but protriptics, mm -hmm. not so much to defend the truth, but to lead one to truth by way, again, of discipline in life. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where we are in our own time. So that's interesting. So uh, you make me think of even just the Beatitudes, Absolutely. right? So, I mean, I'm thinking, blessed are the poor. If you've got a Christian or a group of Christians that manifest an acceptance to poor or to being slighted or all of these types of things, you're saying that that is walking in the way and that by people seeing that, that's actually what proclaims the gospel truth of him who was ultimately poor or him who was ultimately scorned by man. Right. So they're actually able to see Christ through the church living out its life or, or being beautiful and good Absolutely. versus me just thinking, well, I need to like articulate to somebody on the outside with my words right. and create a mental image of the suffering Christ. Right. Rather, they can actually see that through the church or through your earlier example of the martyrs, right? right. Like what a potent example of absolutely. showcasing Christ. Yeah, absolutely. So... It may not be the best approach to our culture to try to prove God's existence or something mm -hmm. like that, but rather to demonstrate by way of your life the manner in which God himself exists. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the Beatitudes, a great example. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, and so forth. That's, that's all halakhic la language, language of the way. How should one comport oneself according to truth, which is understood to be God himself, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, and a passage that uh, has become more and more important for my own thinking is from the Sermon on the Mount. I think in Matthew 6, actually, doesn't really matter. Let your light, which is kind of given John's gospel, it's kind of a Christological title. Mm -hmm. I am the light of the world, right? But but that title now Jesus gives to his disciples. Let your light so shine before men. And now I find this what I call this kind of arithmetic to this statement quite fascinating. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we need to kind of think about that, that nexus that Jesus draws here between them seeing our good works, how we live, and recognizing in some fashion the Father who is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Well, that move is precisely what, if I might, takes place in protreptic literature. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and maybe your your readers would like just to take up, I mentioned it a moment ago, the second century writing called The Letter to Diognetus. It's a great example of protreptic literature. Uh, so 
so all of that, I think, kind of speaks to our context more than kind of the cerebral philosophical approach of trying to prove God's existence or even, and sometimes, you know, people might balk at this, but even trying to prove that the Bible is true and inerrant. So uh, these are oftentimes gets us into weeds. Can you prove that there really was a flood? Can you prove that there was really a whale that swallowed Jonah? Mm -hmm. Can you really prove a six-day creation? And somehow that has to happen before we can get to the truth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? it, and uh, the early church never went that way, frankly. It always, uh, again, Jesus was the norm, but that Jesus was a man. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the second century apologetic pieces, which perhaps is a protreptic piece actually, is the letter of Theophilus of Antioch to a man by the name of Autolycus. Theophilus of Antioch was a bishop of Antioch around the year 180. Okay, so latter part of the second century. And it begins kind of like this. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Uh, Autolycus, who's a non-Christian, asks Theophilus, who is the Christian, show me your God. To which Theophilus responds, you show me your man. Right? And, and there is kind of the distinctive Christian point mm -hmm. that God doesn't reveal himself directly ever, right? He reveals himself only in things which he has made, mm -hmm. most especially humanity itself. Let us make man in, in our, our image, image. Okay. right? So we are to be seen only by way of the man or woman, of course, who we create. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of the fall, this is kind of the broad thematics of the Bible, if you want. By virtue of the fall, man himself becomes kind of what I'm going to call an anti-image of God, mm -hmm. so that fallen man hides God. Mm -hmm. right? And so for God, again, to be strictly speaking, speaking known, there has to be a man who is, in fact, now, again, sinless and perfectly obedient to the will of the Father. And that's certainly one of the major causations or reasons behind the incarnation of God's Son. That's really good. So um, so back to your let your light shine. Right. Right. Is let, uh, we talked about this when you were out there in, uh, at Concordia St. Paul speaking. I'm going to give you my version of the quote, and then you're going to give the accurate one because you corrected <laughs> it, and I can't remember what the correction was, but... It's Irenaeus's quote where he says, "The glory of God is is a yeah. man fully alive." Yeah, there are, there are two that are from Irenaeus, mm -hmm. dated around one eighty, bishop of the city of Lyon. Mm -hmm. uh, the one you're referring to is the glory of God is a living man, mm -hmm. uh, and by living man he meant a man fully possessed by. Uh, moved by, directed by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a baptismal notion. Mm -hmm. But And so the glory of God is how is God actually manifested? How is his glory shown? And there again you have it. It's finally in the man who is fully alive by way of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's a baptismal notion, but that's not going to be perfectly fulfilled and consummated in us until the resurrection of the dead. Is it fair to say it's partially? Well, partially perhaps. Maybe that's why we have to repent of our sins every day. Mm -hmm. But there was a man who was so motivated, mm -hmm. right? So possessed fully that he did not, in fact, sin. And that was, again, Jesus. So while I think in that context, Irenaeus is actually thinking of you and me and all the baptized. It is 
perfectly instantiated in Jesus Christ, who as the Christ, the anointed of the Holy Spirit, is in fact the glory of the Father, mm -hmm. right? And that brings us very directly to certain aspects, say, of John's gospel. He who has seen me has seen my Father in heaven who has sent me, right? Mm -hmm. The other uh, statement that I thought at first you were going to mention was, and it's similar, is the manifestation of the Son is the, how does that go? The manifest, oh yeah, the manifestation of the Son is knowledge of the Father. Mm. So that's a very similar kind of statement. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know the Father in the Son. We don't know the Father directly. He doesn't come and manifest himself directly as the Father, but so we have to know him by a way of a certain mediator, mm -hmm. a certain icon of mm -hmm. the Father. In fact, in the Nicene debates of the fourth century, Athanasius, for example, the Son is actually simply called the image of the Father, the icon to Patras, the image of the Father, mm -hmm. the one in whom one knows the Father how the Father is. So how do we know the will of the Father? Well, you know the will of the Father by paying attention to what Jesus is and does and says. Mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, uh, is, again, is, uh, I, I'm always struck by the importance of anthropology uh -huh. in order as kind of a conduit for theological discourse and thought. The study of man in order to understand the study God. of God. Yeah, right. Uh, let me ask you a question. We talked briefly about this, same thing when you were out there, and I've been fascinated by this idea, and feel free to blow it up if it's a bad idea. But it came from, I was doing a study of Thomas Aquinas. Okay. We talked about that a little bit. And one notion that he kind of drives home is the transparency of Christ, right? And that gets to that whole, well, when you, what do you mean? When you see me, you've seen the Father, right? But he drives that all the way to the point where he, he basically says, notice that Christ's final command is not even to raise me up, but actually to consume me, right? So that he wants to become so transparent that you actually eat of his body, eat of his blood. And so he is that which, which brings anthropology and theology, that, that which brings man into God. Um, so... I'm paraphrasing Aquinas, so you, you speak well, to that and make okay. that accurate. Is he saying that to bring man into God or God into man in this transparency? Um, that's a good question. I, I can't speak for him, I guess it would yeah, be a, well, an aspect I, of both. <laughs> I, he, need to, I need to open up my Thomas Aquinas again. Uh, well, uh, let's stipulate that I'm not quite sure what Thomas is saying here. Yes, yeah. But when I... When I just hear you, and I think maybe Thomas is moving in this direction, oh, what a what a remarkable way of understanding the Eucharist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where we 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 say that we actually eat the the real body and uh, and drink the real blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is Himself the divine Son of the divine Father, made man by way of His incarnation. Mm -hmm. And so we are taking into ourselves the manhood and thereby also the deity of, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and here again, then, uh, this almost transformational aspect of the Eucharistic participation. Mm -hmm. uh, I think sometimes as Lutherans, we emphasize almost maybe exclusively the forgiveness of sins in the Eucharistic participation. And no doubt there's that, no mm -hmm. doubt there's that. But as we often like to say, where there's the forgiveness of sins, there's life and salvation. And life, at least again, if I might bring in certain aspects of John's gospel, life is a person. Mm -hmm. It's not just kind of a gift, kind of, uh, kind of like I'm going to breathe forever or something like that. So we're actually taking into ourselves 
the life of God such as he wishes us to live by way of the man, Jesus Christ. Mm. And so to participate in the Eucharistic sacrament, we are actually being transformed. This is why another thing about the early church, you mentioned Irenaeus, for example, is a good example of this. Eucharistic participation was already a, a beginning transformation that would find its perfection in the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, in fact, Eucharistic participation had bodily benefits. Right? Uh, we don't stress that aspect of the Eucharistic participation so much, but it was definitely there in, in early Christian reflections on the Lord's Supper, which again, were oftentimes directed towards an anthropological understanding. What's, who, what are we actually eating here? We're actually eating the man, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the true man, which is the son of God made flesh, mm -hmm. the means by which God himself comes to us and indwells in us by way of a flesh and blood. That's, that's a pretty powerful notion, actually, if you kind of think think it through mm -hmm. uh, because he's also then yes the life he's the resurrection he's also the will of the father he's the wisdom of the father so all of those things were kind of part of a eucharistic notion and i think maybe thomas is kind of when he mentioned that that christ is kind of purely transparent mm -hmm. that, that was your language maybe thomas's language uh, well, if you think through all those things, yes. I mean, pretty soon, the Eucharistic participation is, in fact, kind of the goal mm -hmm. of becoming a Christian. Right? We are Christians in that and in order that we might participate in his body and blood. Mm -hmm. you know? So... So there's a there's a lot to think about with Thomas. He's he's not early church, but he's pretty good. Yeah, I was, I've been fascinated <laughs> by him. Yeah, I wish I was I wish I was sharper on. It's been about a year since I've yeah. studied, and I don't have the mind you have. So these things kind of just fade out. So, yeah. but well, I mean, he's huge, isn't yeah. he? And so I'm I'm hardly a Thomas expert, I mean, but uh, I do read around in him because he's so big. Mm -hmm. He has a little bit of a bad reputation and amongst us because Luther kind of you know <laughs> kind of dishes on him every once in a while. But but nonetheless, I mean that he was an important Christian voice in the twelfth and thirteenth century, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So as you're talking through this, like the early church, the word you said it early on and it just I think you drove it home there at the end. It seems it's holistic. Right. So there's not this separation of like this kind of like ethereal like grace is kind of implanted in your mind or this ethereal faith you know and then you've got kind of the body of christ over here these things aren't all separate you know you're saying that all of these things are just kind of combined right you can't separate the will of god you can't separate the image of god you can't separate this grace and it's all kind of manifested in the person of christ mm -hmm. and that's so therefore the christian life takes on that form of the light that's in you is going to be the light that's it is christ right right and uh, those are some of the notions that you you certainly drive home right when you get into the book of John. Right. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the the early church before getting into the book of John, or do you want to start? Well, to... let me let me just briefly hook on to what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, the early church thought of man as body and soul, and sometimes there's a what is called a trichotomous view: body, soul, spirit. It doesn't matter so much for the present moment. But there was no such thing, according to the early Christians, and I would say also the, the Bible, that man is specifically his soul and not his body. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been seen as kind of moving toward a Gnostic notion, that mm -hmm. the body was immaterial, imp unimportant, and so forth. So if... If one was to become a spiritual man, that entailed the life of the body, even as it entailed the life of the mind or the life of the soul, the life of the will. Man was 
one by way of the compound unity of all these things. Mm -hmm. And so, again, from that perspective, uh, there was no such thing as kind of a spirit nature. Mm -hmm. You sometimes hear this kind of talk in TV evangelists, we have a spirit nature. I'm never quite sure what they are talking about there. For the early church, the spirit nature would have been how the human person taken totally in all aspects of it of man's being uh, moves together. Mm -hmm. right? If I will correctly, then my body will do that which is right. Mm -hmm. If I think correctly, I will will correctly, and my body will instantiate that in act. Mm -hmm. right? So, so again, the the Christianity was extremely focused upon the flesh or the body, not simply as stuff, you know, as muscle bones and so forth, but as, if you will, the the means by which the soul and the will can instantiate themselves. Mm -hmm. If the if we didn't have a body, if we were a disembodied will, well, okay, you can will all you want, mm -hmm. but you but you can't go to the store, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the body was incredibly important, uh -huh. and of course we see that then very specifically in dogma, if you will, in the incarnation, the, the Eucharist, the real presence, the resurrection of the body, and all those kinds of things. So, but that leads us back to where we kind of began uh, some moments ago. The life that the Christian is called to lead is a crucial aspect. Certainly in early Christian evangelistic outreach, if you will, to mm -hmm. the pagan world of their day. And I think the body is going to be very important, is very important for Christian articulation of truth also in our nihilistic age. Mm. So there's no notion there in the early church that I can do something with my body that's contra to my faith. That would be schizophrenia. That would be... Well, and it's called sin. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so one has to repent of that which is kind of a, a liturgical act, if you can put it in those terms, by which you're kind of reintegrating, if you will, again, mm -hmm. uh, your body, your will, your mind, your soul, with Christian truth. Mm -hmm. right? And hence, you have this wonderful language that we may walk in your way to the glory of, of God the Father that sometimes we say in our liturgies. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, again, that halakhic language, right? To walk in your way. Mm -hmm. And by the yeah, I just make an observation that comes to my mind. I'm always kind of interested in the function of prepositions in in certain certain sentences in discourse. To walk in your way, mm -hmm. right? not according to your way, right? If it were it, that I might walk according to your way, the way then is kind of external to me. Mm -hmm. I am I am behaving in view of what that says or commands. But if I walk in your way, that suggests that the way is the form mm. that your walking must take. And... And that's, I think, uh, very kind of not only interesting, it's, 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 it's interesting, but I think it's also important and, uh, again, leads us to the idea that we have been articulating amongst ourselves here that Christian faith and truth is not simply something we hold by way of an idea. Mm -hmm. I believe this to be true. I believe that also to be true, but I really believe this to be true. But it is, in fact, a form, right? Truth was not simply a proposition, was not simply kind of a notion, but it was, in fact, a reality into which one could be brought. Hmm. And so one could become truthful, right? Hmm. Uh, usually, 
the, the scriptures speak like that by way of the, the language of wisdom. So we have the Proverbs, the wise man does this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, why does the wise man do this? Because he has contemplated the wisdom of God, hmm. which is in the Torah. I'm speaking of like the book of Proverbs now. Yeah. And by contemplating the book of, Pro, uh, the, the, book of the Torah as the wisdom of God, he conforms himself to that wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so he becomes the icon, the image of that wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so it, in New Testament, and certainly the Gospel of John, Jesus is that Torah. He is that wisdom of God. Uh, and therefore the one of whom we are to become icons, images. Mm -hmm. And and that's in John's gospel, that kind of means what it, that kind of is what it means to be a disciple, one who follows him uh, by being conformed to him. You know? So we have in John's gospel, how's this for a segue, by the way? Mm -hmm. We have this language of mutual integration, that the Father is in me and I am in the Father in order that you might be in me and I might be in you. And that we might, I mean, the, the, this wonderful kind of complex interpenetration language that John gives us mm -hmm. all over the place, actually, but especially in John 17. Yeah, if I can take a stab, um, maybe a kind of an illustration. So one thing that's fascinating, I don't know if you've read that hideous strength. Um, this happens in a couple, of, that's the third book of the space trilogy. Uh, some people don't like that title for yeah. it, but it's the trilogy that, that Lewis writes kind of as adult fiction. And one thing that's always struck me, and I think this is what you're talking about as well, is in the story, you have kind of, you really have these cosmic battles that are being fought between, between good and evil, right? Almost Lord of the Rings-esque. And, but the way he ends his book is this all takes place. Well, he starts off, uh, the two main characters are Mark Studdick and Jane is his wife. And they're having, their marriage is kind of on the rocks, right? And then they kind of separate not marriage-wise, but in the story, they kind of go down different paths. And Mark kind of goes into the NICE, into this kind of evil organization. Jane ends up kind of getting brought into, um, almost against her, her will, but she cooperates in the end, into the good organization, St. Anne's, I think is what it's called, right? Cosmic battle takes place, all of that. But then Lewis ends, and the very last chapter, the very last paragraph is about Mark and Jane entering back into the bedchamber. Huh. Okay, and that's how it ends, and it ends with Mark, or with Jane walking in, and she recognizes that Mark's in there, and it's and it ends with, and it was high time that she went in, and that's the <laughs> end of the book. But as you're saying that, right? So these cosmic battles are fought, and it's also that that we may be within Christ, and Christ may be within us, and that right. we may be within God, and that the image of God may be restored, right? So that's right. it's all of this. This is all taking place, not just so that you may like ethereal say a statement like, I believe in Christ, but so that you may live the life, live life fully, right? right? That you may be restored as the image of God right. through Christ. Right. And yes, and, and that life then, uh, as the New Testament tells us over and over again, and the figure of, of Jesus himself, uh, uh, fig, uh, you know, shows forth that life of God is, and Paul gives us all of these long suffering, love, humility, mm. but all joy, patience, all of those kinds of things. And so these, these virtues are finally names for God. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So God is virtue, right? He is, well, we get this in John explicitly. God is love. There's a good example of it. Mm -hmm. But we could say God is humility. Indeed, it, uh, I mentioned earlier on the, the early church father, Tertullian. Uh, he wrote a treatise on patience. And his conclusion is, he comes to the view that God himself is patience. Mm -hmm. so, so to be perfected in these virtues is to be the image of God hmm. in those virtues. 
And so I'm struck a little bit, frankly, if I might say, how little within our own kind of Lutheran context we talk about the virtues. Yeah. But it it was very, very much the, the way in which they, the early church approached the notion of, of God. And of course, in doing so, they were interacting with pagan notions of these various virtues, mm -hmm. which were not completely wrong, mm -hmm. but maybe not also as perfect as the Christians would have it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And that's going to, do you, do you want to jump into John? Because I think all of these things that you've been talking about, now they're going to, they're, they're going to find manifestation in the book of John, right? They're going to find articulation throughout kind of your teaching. Anything else that you want to touch on before no, we... No, that's, we're good. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's, um, and that's one of the things I've appreciated about both your, your studies and your teaching on John and some of your other ones is it brings you, so often we just, we breathe the air of 2023. So... We're just, we get caught in these kind of ideas and this way of looking at the world. And it's so healthy to be brought out of that and into another era where they're, they're not, they're not dealing with the same biases. They're not dealing with some of the same cloudiness that we have. And you just, you get a fresh perspective. I think that's why Lewis said for every one modern book you read, you should read two ancient books. And it's, well, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's really the function of, of history finally mm -hmm. and, and church history, especially for us is that it allows us to read along, think along with these ancient thinkers, medieval thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, even Reformation thinkers, but per persons not of our culture, not bound and obsessed by our questions, mm -hmm. that gives us the potential, the possibility, the opportunity, if we would just take it, of thinking new thoughts. Mm -hmm and seeing that human reality is, is kind of broader, deeper, more universal than our particular concerns might be of today. Mm -hmm. And so, so I just urge your readers to read many ancient books. Yeah. 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 All right. And one ancient book is certainly John. This is one ancient so, book is John. So if someone's going to approach John, um, where, sh where should they start? other than just John 1, 1, but like where should they start in their understanding? Should they have some some ideas in their mind or some the overarching themes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm, huh, I'm not sure exactly how to jump into that one, so let me just jump in. You can jump, jump in somewhere in. else, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me just jump in. Uh, in a way, I suspect it wouldn't be bad to approach the Gospel of John and I'm going to have to qualify this a little later, mm -hmm. but with a tabula rasa, with kind of your mind as an empty blank slate, mm -hmm. and just read it. Uh, uh, but to read it for, for thematic structures, to read it paying attention to its language, uh, to its use of rhetorical and literary uh, images, structures by which it presents its message. Mm -hmm. Because as uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Veltz, actually used to say, the gospel stories may be more than literature, but they're not less than literature. Mm -hmm. And so John is especially adept at using rhetorical schemes like inclusio, in which he begins, as well as ends, a section of text. A chiasm in which you have kind of a progression of A, B, C, B, A, in which C would be the primary point, mm. reinforced by statements B, A. And you build up to the main point, and then you kind of Then, then you kind back. of retreat back, okay. yeah. Uh, and, of course, double entendre is all over John's gospel, the use of a word with double meaning. Mm. So John is also using irony a lot. So you need to be aware of that or come to awareness of that as you read through John's gospel. But I think that's the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my students, it sounds a little simple, 
Yeah, I guess it is simple. But John, like the other Gospels, is intended to be read from the beginning th through the end, mm -hmm. to the end. And just kind of like a novel, so that what you read first is important to mm -hmm. some extent because it's first. Mm -hmm. It sets the thematic character of the text, the questions to be asked of the text, the questions to be answered later on. Mm -hmm. right? So if you read, let us say, the cleansing of the temple, so-called in John 2, uh, it, with, where Jesus is going to be the temple, the new temple of his body. Well, exactly how does that take place? Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't come into, that, that isn't answered in the text until the crucifixion. Right? Mm. So, so what comes first is kind of to be in your mind. It's going to kind of organize your thoughts, your questions as you move through the text. So you just kind of read it as, as you might a book. Now, the qualification for this is that that, that blank mind mm -hmm. <laughs> that I spoke of can't be completely blank uh, because John is, is filled with allusions to the Old Testament. Mm. He quotes, to be sure, the Old Testament quotes it mm -hmm. from time to time, but there aren't a lot of actual quotations of, of the Old Testament text. They do exist, but they're not, they're not kind of like Matthew, right? But what is characteristic of John are these allusions, right? And that if you don't know your Old Testament, you're not going to find the illusion mm. because Let's just take, for example, uh, uh, Jesus as the only son, or sometimes it's translated the only begotten son. That's an allusion to the Isaac story. Mm. The Jews called the binding of Isaac, who was, if you read your Old Testament, Genesis 22, especially in the Greek Old Testament, he's called the monogonase of Abraham, the only son, the beloved son of Abraham. So unless you kind of know that, you're not going to see the binding of Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac, and all the implications of Isaac, of the Isaac story that you find in Genesis 22. Mm when you see that title for Jesus. And let me just move on from that in just a moment. If you read Genesis 22 about the binding of Isaac, and of course, uh, God does not allow Abraham to slaughter Isaac. It's a figure of the crucifixion of Jesus in which God, in fact, does sacrifice his son. So there's this kind of typology of the preliminary and the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. But if you read on with Genesis 22, there's the reassertion of God, God's promise to Abraham that his people will become like the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Mm -hmm. In other words, the illusion is perhaps they're already, if we think the stars in the sand being an illusion to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. as it was certainly later taken to be, we find then in John's gospel that it's by way of the crucifixion of Jesus that the Gentiles will be brought to the new Jerusalem mm. along with the people of Israel in God's final exodus which is understood to be the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. so, so reading Genesis 22 uh, is kind of background text for the language, the only begotten son or the only son of the father. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of an illusion. So but it, there are is, certainly others. Yeah, so is it, would it be the case that at this point when John's writing, 
there's a strong assumption that his audience, certainly at the time when he's writing, would pick up on these things to whereas once again, for you and I that live in 2023, we breathe this air, we're not necessarily living at the same time that John does that we might naturally just miss those things, right? I mean, how often yes. have I read through that and I'm never connecting yes. a, a reference back to Isaac. So right. therefore, we we can naturally have a more shallow reading of what John's really trying to draw you into. Yeah, there was a time, 19th century, early 20th century, where the view was that John was written to a Gentile audience. Mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons, the the finding of the Qumran documents being one of those, but for various reasons, it is now correctly understood, almost universally, that John was writing into a Jewish context, into a Jewish audience, who was reading, having read to them, having expounded to them in synagogue, Sunday, uh, Sabbath after Sabbath. Yeah. And so John must be assuming that his readership, <coughs> that his readership is going to catch these illusions. Mm -hmm. They are steeped in the stories, especially of the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. But also in John's gospel, if I could just mention some other Old Testament texts that are especially important. Certainly some psalms are important. Psalm 69 is very important. Psalm 118 is very, that's Septuagint, or 119. 118, 119 as well. So 118 in our English Bibles? Uh, yes, 118 okay. in our English Bible, 119 in our English Bible okay. is very important. Uh, uh, so 69 I mentioned. Uh, what else? Uh, 24 is very important. Then Isaiah is incredibly important, especially perhaps chapters 52 and 53, mm -hmm. but also the vision of Isaiah in, in Isaiah 6, the temple vision, is very important in John's gospel. Uh, uh, Ezekiel, if I mentioned Ezekiel first here, Ezekiel is incredibly important. The, mm. the description of the eschatological temple, the restoration of Israel as the eschatological temple in which they will dwell and God will dwell forever as the source of living waters and all of that kind of thing. Mm. Ezekiel 36 is a wonderful account of the second and final exodus. Then I was going to mention Zechariah 9 to 14, especially perhaps 14, which speaks of the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. And of course, Deuteronomy, perhaps more than Exodus, Deuteronomy is important in the way John appropriates the, the Exodus account mm -hmm. of, of Israel out of Egypt. So those are some background texts. Uh, others, of course, from time to time come into play. Numbers, for example, with the bronze serpent and so forth. Mm -hmm. But those are the primary texts that serve kind of as background. And you're going to probably miss a lot of Old Testament allusion if you're not somewhat familiar with those Old Testament writings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so it's is it any is it similar to Hebrews in that way where it just kind of it's continually weaving these these Old Testament stories these prophets all of these things into kind of this this composition of a story of revealing who Christ is you you used the the verb weave which is really very good mm -hmm. actually there's uh, in modern literary criticism there's this language of uh, of intertextuality. Uh, or extra textuality. Extra textuality means that, I'm going to use John as the example here, that John is weaving Old Testament narrative into and around the story of Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. right? So Jesus is the story of Jesus 
is being told by way of Old Testament narrative. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, that Old Testament narrative is receiving by way of this extra in textuality, the Old Testament narrative is being seen as fulfilled and consummated in the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then there is what is called intratextuality, which means that within a particular text, you have weavings, and that mm -hmm. takes place in John 2. Uh, one cannot finally articulate what's going on in the passion of Jesus without reading the account of Jesus' baptism, for example. Mm -hmm. But to your point, this is this extra textuality where a text, let us say the Gospel of John, is using another text, let us say Deuteronomy mm -hmm. or Ezekiel or Zechariah or a particular psalm, in order to tell the story of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the story of Jesus is not told then as a maybe a modern biographer might. Mm -hmm. We just take the, 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 the facts of a person's existence, right? Yeah, yeah. And develop the biography by way of a description of where he was born and where he went to school and the degree he got and the jobs he got. You, no, you have to read the Old Testament mm -hmm. in order to get the contours of the significance of Jesus. And all four Gospels do this. I suspect Paul does it. You mentioned Hebrews, a good example of that too. Mm -hmm. Certainly John does that. Yeah. Mm. So there's a lot of depth here. Uh, is there anything else we should talk about? How do you want to go about this? Do you want to do you want to walk through some of the texts as examples? Do you want to talk more about some of these themes? I've heard you talk on a couple other themes that you know. Yeah, could be important. It's, uh, it's you know, uh, you may remember uh, when I was up at St. Paul earlier this year. I kind of started. I often start this way. I don't know how to start. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, so. Oftentimes I start, even when I teach the Gospel of John here at the seminary, I often start this way, uh, just to kind of get a, a preview mm -hmm. of what we will be talking about or the Gospel of John will be presenting to us throughout the quarter or throughout the lecture series or whatever. And that is just to mention several themes mm -hmm. that guide and determine the presentation of Jesus by way of this gospel text. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can do that. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. So in, in no particular order, just as it kind of comes to my mind, I've already actually mentioned one of these in uh, our previous discussion, and that is that Jesus is presented as the new Torah, Mm -hmm. as the new law. Now, some, sometimes we Lutherans don't like the language of, of law. I can't help that. Uh, Jesus is presented as the new Torah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I often have our students read a text like Sirach, an intertestamental text that you find in the Septuagint. Uh chapter 24 of that text. So those who are listening to us might take a look at that text, chapter 24 of Ecclesiasticus, as sometimes it's called, mm. or the book of Sirach, uh, 24, in which wisdom, here we have this idea of wisdom. Wisdom for the Jew was the will of God as it is disposed towards intention or purpose. Uh, so the wisdom of God, we can see wisdom, say, in Psalm 114, which speaks of the birds flying and the cattle grazing, the, the fish swimming in the sea. That's all the wisdom of God. God says, I create a bird. Why? In mm. order that it might fly, right? Mm. And and so the purpose of 
divine wisdom was in the Torah. God gives this wisdom. Why? Well, we actually have already talked about this. In order that man might obey God's wisdom, the Torah, and live the life which is according to God, mm. right? And we find that very theme in Psalm 119, mm -hmm. uh, which is, if, you're, if your listeners, again, read the Gospel of John and read Psalm 119, you will see that Psalm 119 has to be behind the Gospel of John. Uh, I often quote uh, Psalm 119, I think it's verse 110. Five maybe or maybe 115 <laughs> I'd have to take a, a look but your word or your law in some texts is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path mm -hmm. right yeah, we have those themes you were talking about earlier yeah the way, all those, and the, the, way the light the hados the road yeah so jesus calls himself the light of the world he calls himself the way he calls himself the truth. Uh, so the, so it's Psalm 119 is almost a psalmic hymn to Jesus mm. if you read it through John's gospel. Right? So, so Jesus is depicted as the Torah, the, which is the will of God. As God puts that forth, in order that his purposes might come to pass. Mm -hmm. right? uh, Paul uses this imagery in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I preach nothing but Christ the crucified, mm -hmm. who is the power, the dunamis of God, but then the Sophia to the, the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. right? And so what Paul is saying is, like John, the crucified Jesus is the Torah. So one has to finally specify. It's not just Jesus who is the Torah of God or the new law, if you will, because he gives the new commandment, right, that you love one another as I have loved you. Right? Mm -hmm. But it's the crucified Jesus who is the new Torah. And so if we think of a Paul's statement again, I preach Christ the crucified who is the wisdom of God. It means that God crucified his son for a purpose. What is that purpose? That purpose is the forgiveness of sins, that men might have eternal life, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so in John's gospel, those intentionalities of God's wisdom are in fact up in front, I am the life. You know, he who believes in me and follows me has eternal life. So the big word here, the eschatology, the intentionality of God's wisdom becomes also a Christological title, mm. right? He's the way, but he's also the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising then in John's gospel that the last word of Jesus, and it's important that it's the last word of Jesus, is tetelestai, right? Which is, comes from the verb teleo, which is to bring to completion. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the telos, right? And so in the book of Revelation, we have that explicitly. Jesus is the beginning and the end, the arche as well as the telos. Well, John's gospel begins, an arche ain halagos. In the beginning. In beginning was the word or the speech. Mm. And so this speech, which was in beginning, is finally truly manifested by way of the crucifixion of Jesus, so that what God wishes to say and to accomplish by what he says may be a, by way of the cross. So this goes back to your, your focus on prepositions where you say we walk in Christ, right. not so much according to as if what Christ has done is somehow 
finished and then we come after the fact right, right and we're right. kind of some like chapter two right right but right. rather that the christian life persists as an extension of that which is already the beginning and the end right and the wisdom of god has already been made manifest in christ and we're now an extension that uh i don't know what the right word would be but would proceeds be the right way or <laughs> well uh, sometimes language is hard to find yeah. isn't it so one sometimes struggles to find the right terms so it's not bad to use many terms sometimes to, to say what one thinks. Yeah. I would like just to mention again, talk a little bit or just mention a little bit the, the word arche, which is beginning. It's not a temporal beginning in John's gospel. Hmm. So one cannot say at the beginning. So it's not like a lin the way we think of linear time? Is that what you mean? Well, there is linear time. I wouldn't want to deny that. Okay. I'm simply saying that when John speaks of NRK en hologos, he's not speaking of the moment of beginning when God created the world. Uh -huh. He's speaking of a source. So you have what, what we call this, this uh, durative imperfect. <clears throat> en, NRK en Hologos was, which is an a durative imperfect, which means it, as the father says, it it, it stretches backward into e in the into infinity and eternity, mm. as well as forward to be sure, but backwards. In other words, our K becomes the reality of God, mm. right? And so the next phrase. Hologos ain prostan theon, often translated the word, I usually use the language of speech here for logos. The speech was with God becomes kind of a qualifier for the NRK. The NRK was a divine reality in which the logos was with God, which obviously must mean his father. Mm -hmm. right? And so you find this, this wonderful connotative meaning that the origin, the source, the arche, out of which the Logos came to be made flesh was out of a filial relationship mm. which he had with his father, right? So this is a creedal language, right? I mean, that this Very there much was so. never a time that the son was not, not with the father. The son right. was always with the father. Oh, He's no. the speech of the father. Yeah. He's the will made manifest of the father. Right. And there's never a time where that relationship is not. Right. Is it fair to say it's outside of time? Well, I suppose, uh, because we're talking about now the imminent reality of God. Okay. But, and I would like, I want to come back to that, but just... Uh, just something before I do. Uh, the this idea of the RK as the source out of which the logos comes and becomes man is not apart from his filial. We get this from the narrative of John himself. Mm -hmm. The filial or the sonship of the logos with his father. Right. So we have this idea already that when the Logos becomes flesh, becomes man and dwells amongst us, that filial relationship, which is of God himself, mm -hmm. now becomes the way in which the man Jesus, who is the incarnation of that son, is the way the man Jesus lives. Mm. And so in John's gospel, we have language like this. I do not do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Right? And so here we see this wisdom notion again. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the incarnation of the will of God. And because he's the incarnation of the will of his father, by what he does, by what he says, we come to know the Father. Mm -hmm. What is the will of the Father? 
well, pay attention to what Jesus does and what he says. Yeah. Right? And as we noted when we talked about Paul, within the will of God is a purpose. Right? So he is the telos of God's utterance. Why do, unto what end or purpose does God speak mm. in order that his son might be crucified for the life of the world? Mm. Right? Now, what I want to also point out with the language of R.K., all of this is said to be from the arche, from the source. And so we see then a theological notion. God is such as we see Jesus Christ. Right? And so there's God's speech in, within God. Mm -hmm. The logos really means address or speech. The speech of the Father is in our K, right? It doesn't just begin at creation. It doesn't just begin at the incarnation. It is who God is, right? God is his speech. He is a communicator. Is that a way he to say it? He is a communicator. Okay. And, and unto what end his purpose is already in God, right? And that purpose is kind of becomes the Trinitarian third person, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. So it's by way of the Holy Spirit that the speech of God becomes what we are. So we become connected to that speech, which has always been of the Father via right. the Holy Spirit. Right. So the Father speaks eternally through his Son uh, and, and reaches its intention, if you will, within God himself by way of the Holy Spirit. So when Christ then is incarnated, if he wills us, that is to say the Father, wills us to be his children, he gives to us the Holy Spirit, hmm. right? And so we see a deeply kind of Trinitarian theology already by by way of the story of Jesus and this first remarkable verse of John's gospel. Mm -hmm. In the beginning was the speech of God, and the speech of God was toward prostantheon, was filially, that is to say, as a son related to his father, and the Logos was God. This was God. Mm. So... So there's, it's not surprising, perhaps, then, that John's gospel played such an important role in the Nicene debates about the deity of Christ. None of this makes sense theologically, right, unless the word is God as well as the Father, mm -hmm. but also the debates of the 4th and 5th centuries concerning the deity of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So we cannot receive the life of the Son unless we receive the Holy Spirit <coughs> who is the Spirit of the Son. Mm -hmm. And so we see then in, say, in John 3, if one wishes to become begotten from above, that is to say, a child of one of the Father, which is normally, my father. normally translated born again, but you're saying be to have been begotten. Begotten, from begotten above. is a better translation mm -hmm. because the Father is in view, yep. not, not a mother. So unless unless one is begotten from above, later on said water and spirit, mm -hmm. one cannot enter or see the the reign or the rule or the kingdom of God. And and already in the prologue, we see this language. Those who believed in him, he gave the power to become the children of God, not those who were of the flesh or of the will of man or so forth, but those who were begotten ek theu, out of God, right? Mm. Not simply by God, but out of him, that powerful preposition of the Greek ek, out of, so that 
what you receive out of God indicates then that you participate mm. in some manner with that which is of God himself. John call, calls that eternal life. Mm. So I'd, if I were to take a stab at a couple of illustrations, because that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so one, I did think of like a fountain, right? So when you were talking about like time and RK and coming out of something that's there, it's almost like a, a fountain and there's streams of water that come from a source, right? Right. And so when you look at a fountain, that might be helpful because you a fountain, you don't think of it as within time. You can think of like an eternal fountain, right? right. The, the, the river, the water that I see is always proceeding from something that's before. Right. And then I also thought of like a song to where it's like if I hear a, uh, an opera singer singing that it's coming out of the opera singer and it's reaching me and I'm being connected and I'm knowing the opera singer by what I'm receiving, but it comes out of. So in that right. same way, I'm connected to the opera singer via the speech and the beauty. Right. And in the same way, I know the father by his speech and the speech, the will is the son and then via being receiving the holy spirit water and the holy spirit now i'm being connected to that source which is reality itself yes and you are to be then conformed to the spirit it's kind of a baptismal notion mm. receiving the spirit who's the image of the son mm -hmm. who is himself the image of the father by way of the spirit one becomes an image of the father mm -hmm. okay and that kind of goes back to what I said earlier about Matthew 6, where Jesus says, be the light of the world, that your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in mm -hmm. heaven, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it is interesting to note that uh, you, you mentioned this fountain image. Already in Tertullian, in his work against Proxius, the first Trinitarian treatise that we have in Christian literature, uh, he uses three images or figures in order to give the Trinitarian character of God as both one but distinct. Mm -hmm. right? And one of them is, in fact, the fountain, mm. where you have the fountain, the source, the arche, the headwater, if you will. Mm -hmm. That would be the Father. Then you have the stream or the river which flows out of it. Later on, the church would use language like begotten from the Father or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have the refreshment mm -hmm. or the coolness that one receives by way of the stream or the water. That's the spirit, right? Yeah, that's okay. beautiful. The Another image is, and, and perhaps more common, we find it in the Nicene Creed already, is that Christ is phos ekphotos, light out of light, mm -hmm. right? And so you have the Father as the source of light, if you will, the light bulb, right? Mm -hmm. Or the sun, if you want. The sun then is the ray of light that comes out. It's the light source projecting itself outward. Mm -hmm. okay? And the Holy Spirit would then be the illumination, right? So we see this even in our setup. We have the light behind me or behind you. There's the ray of light, but we have the illumination which allows things to be seen and known, right? Mm -hmm. So, I see you, and so I know there's a ray, mm -hmm. right? And because there's a ray, there's a source, right? And so again, the Holy Spirit becomes kind of the entree to the knowledge of the Father, mm. right? not just the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Father. Through the Holy Spirit, we know the Son in whom we know the Father. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a baptismal idea again. This yeah, so the, why why don't we use these more? These are two of the most beautiful well, explanations I've gotten uh, of the Trinity. I, I mentioned Tertullian in his letter uh, treatise against Proxius, but these images were p actually picked up by by others. I'm just going to mention Athanasius, uh -huh. uh, 
uh, in the fourth century when he wanted to argue for the full deity of the, of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in his letter to an Egyptian bishop by the name of Serapion. Mm -hmm. So he, he picks up those very images of Tertullian. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he had ever read Tertullian. I kind of doubt it, frankly. Really? <coughs> but if, if my hunch is right, and he didn't get it from Tertullian directly, then it would simply be an indication to what extent those images were kind of common, uh, yeah. common images that the church was using more broadly. And mm -hmm. that's what I actually think was the case. Okay. Regular Brian's out there were using them as sermon illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See, so yeah, as you say that too, I also think of, um, I mean, that kind of connects even the light illustration, right? I mean, because John 1 goes on and says the, the darkness cannot overcome it, it, right? So we are, to tie it back to something you said earlier, right? We're made in the image. Darkness corrupts that so that we no longer, we no longer shine out the light of God. Exactly. But then this light shines from the source, from the Father. The Son come, becomes incarnate, breaks through the darkness, right. connects with us. The Holy Spirit now maybe enlightens us right. with that which proceeds from the Father. It is the Son. Right. And now that allows that image to be restored. Well, now, once again, you can become the light of the world right. because you're in Christ. Yeah. And Paul, of course, uses uh, uh, the image of light for his own person as apostle. Mm -hmm. I am the light of the world. There in what is it, Acts 13, I believe. So he is the image of the Son or of Christ, the ascended Lord in this case. Uh, and as the image of Jesus, he is a Christological figure. Mm -hmm. And hence his sufferings, especially in 2 Corinthians perhaps, become kind of the form in which Christ is amongst us, right? Yeah. So you have to accept the apostle within the fact of his sufferings. That's kind of the burden of 2 Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. There are these super apostles, he calls them, which actually don't believe he's an apostle. Mm -hmm. Why not? Well, he's he's a suffering. <laughs> you know, he's, yep. he's shipwrecked, he's imprisoned, stoned, and whipped, and all the rest. Well, an apostle of the ascended Lord wouldn't have that happen. Right? Yep. So the, uh, he defines then his apostleship by way of his sufferings. Yeah. This is especially the case in 2 Corinthians, you know, 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, the, and, and then again, we mentioned the martyrs at the very beginning of our discussion. They too were seen as Christological images. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, strangely enough, they, the Christians who witnessed or who heard about the martyr of their compatriots saw them as images of eternal life because it mm. was by way of the death of the Son or by way of now of his disciple that life itself was going to be manifested. Mm -hmm. So, and that's very distinctly, I mean, it's a very strange notion, I think, to us because usually we are, and this isn't exactly wrong, but it's not, <laughs> it's not quite John either. It's not that Jesus suffers and then the resurrection overcomes that, yeah. right? And as it were, puts the cross into the past tense. I really, you spoke on this when I was in St. Paul, and this was light bulbs were just kind of going off. So if, if you can take time and drill into this, because I yeah. think this is important. I tried to articulate this a little bit in a Bible study shortly after you came, and I don't think I did a great job of well, it. So, I'm well, I'm not sure I do a very great job, because as I say, it's a kind of a strange notion to mm -hmm. us, because we tend to think oftentimes as the resurrection, as overcoming suffering. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so the resurrection puts, as I often state it, puts the cross into the past, right? Uh, but if we just think of the iconography of Christianity, uh, the crucifix is an icon of Christian faith, right? The martyr 
namely the one who died for faith, was the image of of Christ, the image of God, mm -hmm. the image of eternal life. Uh, we have the sacraments in which we are baptized into his death as well as his resurrection. Uh, we partake of his body and blood, which is given and shed for you, sacrificial language. So we are partaking of a sacrifice, right? And then, of course, one of the most important and central images uh, within the, the church is the altar, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we have altars in our church spaces and that that space not be given up to a praise band or something like that. Yep. But, because the altar is indicative not of something that has happened, but is indicative of the manner, the form in which the Lord Jesus now comes amongst us. Mm. Right. He is a crucified Messiah. He is the crucified Lord. Mm. Yes. And, uh, and so the crucifix is not a, you know, sometimes you hear this argument, let's get rid of the crucifix, have an empty cross because he's no longer on. That's not how the New Testament works. Even the fact that the apostles, if I go back to Paul for a moment, the apostles were known as apostle by virtue of their sufferings. Paul is just the best example of that in the New Testament because he speaks of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. But you have this idea that the apostle, of course, comes from the Greek to be sent, right? But the Jew had this idea, the one who is sent, namely the apostolos, is as the one who sends him, mm. right? And so you know the sender in the one who has been sent. That idea pervades the Gospel of John. I do not say anything from myself, but what I say has been given me to say by my Father in heaven who has sent me. Right? Therefore, he who hears me hears him who sent me. Right? Mm -hmm. Or I do nothing from myself. I am not the source. I'm the word, I'm the speech, but I am not the speaker, right? Mm -hmm. So what I say, what I do is not from myself, but what I do has been given to me by him who sent me. Therefore, he who sees me sees him who sent me. Well, Jesus then is the apostolos of the Father in whom the Father is known. Mm -hmm. So the one sent is the manifestation of the sender, or the sender is known in the one whom he sends. Well, that idea extends to the, to the 12, to Peter, to Andrew, Philip, and so forth. Paul, certainly. These are apostoloi, the sent ones. So it's not surprising. Paul's the great example of this, but tradition often had it with the others as well. They showed themselves to be apostle by what they said and what they did, right? They said what Jesus said. They were preachers of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. They did what Jesus did. And so you have stories, take them to be legendary or no, but they had stories of them raising the dead and healing the sick and, of course, evangelizing the unbeliever and all that kind of thing. Well, these are all Christological stories because they were apostles. Mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, it, it's a very important notion, the, the idea of, of, of apostle. And then we saw this also in the martyr. Right? They, they, too, were Christological images because they stood steadfast. We see this in Revelation 2 that Christ is the true martyr, he who is steadfast, right, faithful, steadfast unto death. I will give him the crown of life. So we kind of think of the cross or the suffering of the martyr as precedent mm. to, to eternal life and salvation. And there is kind of that. There's a logical precedence, no doubt. 
But, but what the church also saw, especially by way of New Testament proclamation, is that the will of God for eternal life was seen to be in the full obedience of the martyr or the apostle or Jesus the Son to the Father's will. And that full obedience oftentimes would lay within the suffering itself. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't morbid. The suffering was, was indeed eventually going to be, if I might, rewarded by glory and eternal joy. But nonetheless, the suffering, the steadfastness within suffering was a manifestation of obedience to the Father. And hence, might sound a little strange, a manifestation of divine will. Hmm. God did will the martyr to suffer in order that he might be known. Mm -hmm. And hence, the ongoing exhortation to be faithful, the book of Revelation again, be faithful unto death, and you shall receive the light of the sun, uh, the eternal life. And of course, Jesus was then the pistos martyr, right? Mm -hmm. The faithful martyr himself, because he was the faithful son even unto death. So over and over again in John's gospel, Jesus says, I came not to do my will. Here we have that again, right? But the will of him who sent me. And if we ask the question, all of John's gospel, what finally is the will of the Father? It is that he go to the cross hmm. and there defeat the powers of Satan. And I wish to stress this adverb, there, right? Mm -hmm. Therein, and not apart from there, defeat the powers of Satan. But there also, having defeated the powers of Satan, sin and death, it is within, and this is John's gospel, kind of in a nutshell, therein, namely within the crucifixion of Jesus and the crucified Jesus is eternal life. Mm. So in chapter 12, 11, when he raises I, uh, Lazarus from the dead, he calls himself, I am the resurrection and the life. But chapter 11 is already pervaded by allusions or intimations of his coming cross. Hmm. And so it's going to be there where the resurrection and his life-giving life is located. Hmm. And so at the very beginning, we have him tossing out the money changers. There's an allusion already to his crucifixion, which will be the place in the form of the new temple from which from which living waters will flow. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Ezekiel early on and that vision of the eschatological temple from which living waters will flow. So there's a pointer already to John 19 and the spear thrust in which water and blood, sanctifying, purifying waters flow from his side. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of that is very important for understanding what's going on in John. So, <laughs> so way back when, some, some moments ago, I was going to give you a, an account of various themes. Yes, yeah. I got one. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got one. Uh, Jesus as the, as the new Torah or as the Torah, the will of God. Yeah. And therefore the intention or the purpose of God as well. Yeah. The first theme so Christ as Torah, Christ as the will of God. And now you say we got two more themes to, to dive yeah, into. Yeah, uh, a very important theme, critically important for John's gospel, is the temple theme. Mm -hmm. uh, and in John's gospel, it is the crucified Jesus, not just Jesus, but the crucified Jesus who is the temple. Uh, and 
it's very important to get an, a clear idea of the significance of the temple for Jewish eschatology, for Jewish expectation, for Jewish hopes. Of course, where there is a temple, two things were always immediately included in that. Mm -hmm. One was it's where God dwelt. So we, we have the language of dwelling in John's gospel. The flesh become, the word becomes flesh and dwelt amongst us. So we've That's covered temple talk. So first of all, where there was a temple, there was the dwelling of God. And important, there's sacrifice, hmm. right? So when you already, when you just kind of consider those two aspects of temple, certainly the Jewish temple, mm -hmm. one already begins to see the nexus, the close association between sacrifice and God himself. Right? And so that God is known by way of the sacrifice of Jesus, or that the crucifixion of Jesus is the manifestation of his father, hmm. is already kind of part of the temple theme. So there's, there's one important passage in John's gospel, John 8, 28, which we'll talk about perhaps from another point of view as well, where Jesus, speaking to the Jews, says, when you lift me up, that is to say, crucify me, then you will know I am, mm. right? So the crucifixion of, of, of Jesus, or better, the crucified Jesus, important, lies within the identity of God. Mm. So one can only know God by way of the crucified Jesus. So we can make a mistake if we try to separate and just say, if we take the word crucified off and it's just, you'll just know the Father via the Son. But no, 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 you have to also know the Father via the crucified Son. That's where he is made right. manifest to right. his fullness. Right. And here we can go back to what I just alluded to earlier in our discussion, the iconography of the crucifix, for example, mm -hmm. the significance of the martyr uh, as, as making known uh, God by way of their death. They, they are martus, right? a witness by way of their death. Right? How, how, how do we think about that? Well, if we understand this idea that sacrifice makes God known, uh, his sacrifice makes himself known, then we begin to perhaps understand this idea. So you're bringing back a question I had earlier, and this, so you said, the Father is known by the apostolos, and the apostolos of the Father, the one who is sent by the Father is the Son, and then the Son sends us, and he says also, pick up your cross and follow right, me. And right. you talked about the martyrs being the icon of Christ, right? right? But, so is there something to where, as, you know, for those that are listening, for us modern Christians, we certainly probably despise the suffering that might come with Christianity much more. And for us, we might be tasting it for the first time, you know, right. towards 30 years, not so ago, right. not so much. But is there something that you cannot, you are, what's a good way to put this? You're, you are blocking the way by which God or Christ will be known through you if you despise suffering. Yeah, if you avoid it or apostatize from it, hmm. right? So if there, there's going to be various ways, I suspect, where the Christian is going to have to stand steadfast, right? Uh, and in by way of that steadfastness, you will r reveal, manifest the God who is. Mm -hmm. God is steadfast in his own truth. That is to say, he is steadfast in his own reality who he is and how he is, who he is. And so, yeah, the, uh, the notion of obedience is oftentimes um, misunderstood and certainly kind of denigrated, if you will, as though it's work righteousness or something like that. The idea of obedience, however, 
was to be rightly ordered to truth, right? To be obedient was to to make oneself an a visual instantiation, be kind of a big word, a, a visual icon, image of someone's will, mm. right? And we've already talked about that. Jesus was himself precisely because he was the son obedient to his father. Mm. And in John's gospel, that obedience is fundamentally that he goes to the cross. Right? So in John 12, for example, very important passage, actually, in John 12, 27, kind of an echo, if you will, of the Gethsemane scene. Jesus says, my soul is deeply upset, deeply grieved, uh, in turmoil, one could even translate. Uh, but what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? Right. This is the Johannine form of the Gethsemane prayer. Right? Mm. Father, be thy will, remove this cup from me. Yet not, what, my will, but yours be done, right? In John 12, 27, Jesus goes on, Yet it is for this hour, the hour of his passion, that I came into this world. One could also say that I was sent into this world. The coming of Jesus is nothing other than his being sent by the Father. And then Jesus says, Father, he addresses the Father, glorify your name, mm. which is basically mean crucify me. Right? Mm. So, so the will of the Father by way in which he is to be known is the crucifixion of Jesus. Now that seems a little morbid, Perhaps he sacrifices his son. Uh, but Jesus, as the crucified one, reveals himself to be, yes, the son of the father by way of his obedience. But in everybody's favorite passage, John 3.16, it is also the, the substance, the form of, of the Father's love for the world, right? Uh, because it's there, and here I want to use kind of a temple idea, space. When, you're, when your hearers read John's Gospel, I mentioned earlier about certain rhetorical aspects and mm -hmm. so forth in images, but very important is the spatial categories, which is a function of the temple notion. Because if I can go back to the temple for a moment, dwelling of God, place of sacrifice, right? So we already begin to get the idea that the crucified Jesus in his sacrifice, that the new temple will subsist, right? But the temple was also the place of redemption, very important to, to realize that according to Jewish eschatology, the temple was the location of salvation. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we, we see this you know, in Psalm 24, for example. It, it ends, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Right? Mm -hmm. So the temple was not just the location where sacrifices were done, it was also the place of salvation, the place of redemption. And so Jewish eschatology, Jewish expectation, Jewish hope always was focused on a final exodus in which God will draw all of his people from the nations, draw them to a Jerusalem, draw them to the eschatological temple as the place of his own dwelling, mm. and there, and only there, will he be their God and they will be his people. Right? So does this bring us back to something you spoke to earlier, we were discussing 
but just the importance of once again God's manifestation in the body and blood of Christ, in not the, just in some ethereal message, right. but in the Eucharist. In right? the Eucharist, right? And so it's not surprising that early Christianity, to go back to the patristic writers, they saw these temple notions as Eucharistic notions. Uh, one of the characteristics of John's gospel that especially illustrates this temple idea is that John, not the synoptics, interestingly enough, but John, John's gospel, also the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. especially chapters 21 and 22, those final chapters, all have as their basic thematic and imagery th that which comes from the Jewish festival of tabernacles, mm. which was a festival that especially looked forward to that final exodus in which God would draw in, gather. It was a harvest festival in a way. It was, uh, tabernacles took place during the month of October, so harvest time. So in gathering, he will gather in his people from the nations to which mm -hmm. he had sent them in judgment, right? Gather them in to the Holy Land or Jerusalem or the temple. You find all three kind of meaning the same thing here, mm -hmm. just depending upon the thematic that it's in play. And so not surprisingly then, John's gospel employs the festival of tabernacles. The crucified Jesus is in fact now the new and final festival of booths or tabernacles. And so in John 12, Jesus can say, when I am lifted up out of the earth, I shall draw all to myself, mm. right? He is the place to which this ingathering will finally take place. Well, he says that because throughout John already, he is as the crucified. Because when I am lifted up, right, I will draw all to myself. So the myself of that sentence is the crucified Jesus. Hmm. So the crucified Jesus is the new temple place. So to be, one might say this, to kind of use uh, a saying from Cyprian, extra Christum crucifixum non solace est. Outside the crucified Christ, there is no salvation hmm. because he is the new temple. Not surprisingly then, early Christians <clears throat> use these festival of tabernacles notions <coughs> as baptismal and Eucharistic notions. Mm -hmm. A good example of this, you, in fact, you mentioned the Eucharist just a moment ago, but say the, the prayers that we find in chapters 9 and 10 of the Didache, the first century Christian text, very early then, the didache of the apostles, of the 12 apostles. Sometimes these prayers are dated as early as the 50s, oh, wow. in which case they are very, very early. Showing what the church is is, is speaking about, yeah. praying about 20 years after Christ's yeah, just 20 crucifixion. Years. The, the whole document in which these chapters now ex exist have been dated anywhere from roughly 90 to 140 or so, but those prayers are more ancient than that document, uh -huh. right? And so you have this. <clears throat> As the seed, note the, the harvest agricultural imagery here of ingathering, okay? Mm -hmm. Comes from the temp uh, Feast of Tabernacles. As the seed was scattered upon the hillsides and has been gathered together into one loaf, right? Mm. So let your church be gathered from the four corners of the world into your church, right? Well, you can see the the festival of tabernacles as a Eucharistic, as a Eucharistic image, right? 
That's good imagery too for the word just communion. Well, yeah, that word's yeah, ascribed I, to I, it. We are participating by way of Eucharistic participation mm -hmm. in the one loaf. Notice how Paul stresses the unity in Ephesians. One God, one Lord, one bread, one cup. You know, we confess in the creed, we believe in one church. I mean, the idea of unity is, is a very eschatological, salvific, and redemptive notion, right? Being scattered was always an image of being in judgment. Mm -hmm. Being in union with Christ is one church under one head. That was always an image of redemption. So in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And I have other sheep, not of this fold, but I must also, what? Gather them in mm. and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So, so the festival of tabernacles is, is, is crucial, but it, it's really a function, if you will, of the theme of temple as the place of redemption uh, and the need then for a new exodus in order to come to or be drawn to that place mm -hmm. by divine drawing. And, and that was a baptismal notion. One is drawn to the unity of Christ, to the unity of the church by way of baptism, which brought you out from the various peoples of the world into one people, mm -hmm. namely the church of God. You've been grafted into. You've been grafted into Christ, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A uh, couple questions. This first one, you can just say, no, Brian, I don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but you, you just you kept mentioning kind of this unity aspect, you know, being brought in, even John 17, right, where he Praise in his high priestly prayer, Father, may they be one as we are one. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Peter Kreef speaks to this a couple of times. If you know Peter Kreef, he's at Boston College. Um, but what what's your sense of of that reality? And then we look at our reality, and we do see, you know, Roman Catholic, LCM, you know, just go down the road of all of these different church bodies. Um, is it important to, or is it important for us to? desire unity even if we don't get there but is that important that there's some aspect of we shouldn't just be content with let's let's have all this disunity within christ's church because we are supposed to be one loaf well i think it in some sense we have to answer that with a yes don't we mm -hmm. uh, at the same time although john 17 was very much used for the ecumenical enterprise uh, John 17 is not talking about what we might call institutional unities mm -hmm. so that Presbyterians really must get together with the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, the unity of which John 17 speaks is fundamentally the unity which the Son has with his Father by which is manifested, it may be an ontological unity, but it is manifested precisely by, and we've mentioned this already, the filial obedience of the Son to the Father's will, mm. so that he speaks what the Father speaks, because he is the word or the speech of God, but he also does what the Father wills, right? And so, now in that John 17, Jesus prays to the Father that those whom he has been given from the world might also be in them as he is in the Father. Right? Mm. So there he is speaking quite directly, first of all, of the apostolic minister. Mm -hmm. So the apostolic minister is one with Christ the head of the church, by virtue or manifesting that unity with Christ, by, vir by virtue of what we might call preaching right doctrine and leading his people to right praxis. So right? Christ is praying that I'm not a heretic. <laughs> that, that's right. right. And so it's not just getting together. Uh -huh. It is getting together within the unity of the potential the Father's will mm -hmm. and the Father's intent. And then later on, 
Jesus will extend that prayer out. And I pray also for all of those who will believe through your logos, through your word, through your preaching, right? And so, so again, they too are to be one with the preacher mm -hmm. and through him, one with Christ and through him, one with the Father by way, again, of a, of a filial or, if you will, a childlike, because they're techna to theru, the children of God, mm -hmm. by way of a childlike obedience to the Father's will. They will speak like the Father. They will do the Father's will in their life and so forth. So there, there is always... I, I think we have to say this, there is always within that the idea of what we call right doctrine, mm -hmm. right? Right confession, uh, the recitation, maybe this is how we liturgically do this, is yes, we, we judge the preacher and what he says and so forth, but we also recite the creed. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the common confession of the faith. And we even say that, let us confess our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what every church in every place is to do. And so should it be the case that the Lutheran church, let us say, give ourselves the benefit of the doubt here, should the Lutheran church confess the Nicene Creed, but Church B over here says, well, we don't do that, and we're not quite sure of all the articles within that creed. Well, John 17 doesn't override that. Mm -hmm. It's rather saying to this, this other church, get on board with this, or mm -hmm. you have no reason or right to want to be one with the Lutherans over here. And that's why the best ecumenical praxis was always, can we agree upon truth, right? Because, and we started this way when we talked at the very beginning of our discussion, life, yes, life may be kind of the entree, right? But it has rootage in truth. That's why it is an image of truth, right? And if you get your truth right, if you say, we have to be like this, mm -hmm. irregardless of the truth, then you have broken this deep association and unity of truth and life. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see this again, even in John's gospel, where Jesus is himself as the singular person which he was and is. He is truth, but he is also life, right? And so, so there is such a thing as heresy. There is such a thing as heterodoxy that breaks that unity. Mm -hmm. uh, so one cannot, one cannot so desire the, the, the coming together of you two, you, you choose the, the church bodies that you want to, mm -hmm. so that the the union in right confession is compromised. It 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 doesn't work, and it's frankly against what John seventeen is really all about. That's a good explanation. So you've you've already said the Son does not His will but the Father's will. His prayer here is that the disciples, in the same way, will not do their will but they would do Christ's will, which is the Father's will. Exactly. And the prayer then goes on to say, and may the the LCMS in 2023 do as the apostles have said, which is Christ's will, which is the Father's exactly. will. Right. And if you leave that for the sake of, but we want to be kumbaya, we want to be just, right. you know, great and cozy with everyone around us, we can separate ourselves from Christ right. and from the Father and now be joined to the nations of the world, right? The and, ways and, of yeah, the world. Absolutely. And in fact, you articulated very nicely what I called kind of the kaleidoscopic character of John's gospel, mm. primarily through the five paraclete sayings in John 14, 15, and 16. Paraclete being the Holy Spirit. Well, it is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But 
the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, shall bring to your mind all that I have said and done. Hmm. And, and the voice of the paraclete is, I think, in the first instance, the Gospel of John itself. Mm -hmm. But it also entails the apostolic witness, right? So John's Gospel is a little cheeky in this. He's, I think he's saying, hey, apostolic preacher, if you want to preach according to the Spirit, you preach on the basis of the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. But that being said, we would, we would hear, actually hear the voice of the paraclete by way of the apostolic preacher, right, uh, who is preaching on the basis of this text, the Gospel of John, which is an account of what Jesus said and did, mm -hmm. which is itself the inscripturated, if you will, voice of the Father. Mm -hmm. So we come to know the Father by way of apostolic preaching, right? You hear the voice of the preacher, which is the voice of the paraclete, which is the voice of the Son, which is the voice of the Father. Mm -hmm. So we come to know the Father by way of Christological preaching. Mm. Uh, and that's really the point of John 17 as well. And so where that apostolic preaching is not Trinitarian, is not Christological, is not sacramental, is not ecclesial in the proper sense, uh, there there's that, that kaleidoscopic character is, is kind of broken. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and the unity of which Jesus is speaking in John 17 actually has that whole kaleidoscopic relationship of here, apostolic preacher, paraclete speaking, Jesus as word speaking, yeah. which is the father speaking, has all of that in mind, right? So it, it's a little more complex than let's just get together. And, and it's <laughs> yeah. really terrible that we're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. That was good. Yeah. Um, anything else to say on the uh, temple, right? Christ says the temple. And just as a quick note, you have a class in 20 minutes. Okay. So we, for those following, uh, we probably, we're not going to walk through the whole book of John. We'll certainly have you back on, but at least we can cement these, I think, three themes, which okay. would get anyone ready to go for yeah. reading through the book. Well, let me just summarize the temple, mm -hmm. all right? Temple is the place of divine dwelling. This, for that reason alone, it's the place of redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the place of sacrifice. So it's the crucified Jesus that is the place of the temple. Uh, it is the place to which the final eschatological uh, exodus will will come to mm -hmm. kind of a baptismal notion, right? We are baptized out of the nations into his death and resurrection mm -hmm. in the one font, the one baptism. We believe in one baptism for the remission of sins, as we say in the creed. Uh, so all of that is in play concerning the temple. Uh, then, and so... John's Gospel very much plays on these temple themes. Uh, significantly, the first time Jesus is in Jerusalem, uh, or oh, I might just back up a step, one, one of the things that characterizes John and is different from the synoptic accounts is that except for some few contexts, chapter 6, for example, Jesus is always in Jerusalem in John's gospel. Mm. And starting with chapter 7, verse 2, until the end, he is always in Jerusalem. Now, he may be nearby. For example, he goes to Bethany or something during the time of Lazarus' uh, uh, death and so forth. But other, but that's just nearby. I mean, that's just walking a suburb. distance. Yeah, yeah, suburb, right, of Jerusalem. And so one can see just in the geography of John's gospel, the centrality of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. That's not happenstance. 
Is uh, you mentioned the Temple of Booths? Is it true that for the Temple of Booths, did you have to be in Jerusalem? I, I did to not celebrate? mention that, but you are absolutely right. To okay. celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles, one had to be technically within the city of Jerusalem, because that was the place of redemption to mm -hmm. which all would be drawn in the final Exodus. So yes. So the fact that Jesus is in Jerusalem so often, virtually all the way through John's Gospel, already tells us thematically that this temple theme is central. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising then that the first time he is in Jerusalem, namely in John 2, he throws out the money changers mm -hmm. and overturns their, their tables and so forth. And we are told then that he tells the Jews who say, hey, what the, what the heck are you doing? Show us a sign that you do these things. And he says, should you do away with this body, uh, I will raise it up in three days. And then the evangelist lets us understand what is at stake here. He said this in order to indicate his body, right? Mm -hmm. His body will become the not us, the place of sacrifice. Hmm. So that temple theme is, is, is in John up front. In the synoptic accounts, it's not until his one and only visit at the very end. But in John, it's at the beginning. So it's thematically in play as you read through the gospel text of, of John. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so we find it then as most especially in two festivals, Passover, of course. I behold the Lamb of God who bears the sin of the world. That's already stated by the Baptist when G Jesus is being baptized or it comes to him to be baptized. And then, of course, we find it also in uh, uh, the temple idea in uh, uh uh, the Festival of Tabernacles. So mm -hmm. Passover and Tabernacles, two significant temple festivals, mm. were are significant in John's presentation of Jesus. He is the final Passover. He is the final Festival of Tabernacles by way of and in his crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And then just briefly kind of the third thing maybe it's not so much a theme but it has to be noted in John's presentation and that is John speaks of Jesus crucifixion as his exaltation right uh, on three occasions the greek verb hupsao which means to lift up mhm mm or to exalt is used of his crucifixion. It's one of those double entendres that I mentioned way back in our conversation where a word can take on two different meanings. It certainly means to lift up. The cross is being lifted up from the earth. It certainly means that. Mm -hmm. But it also is the technical term for his ascension, right? mm. uh, So, which we have in, say, Acts 2. He was ascended into heaven or... Uh, so that's is ascension language. It was also the language of a king's enthronement because the throne of a king was set high. And so when the king was going to be crowned, he ascended upon his throne. Mm -hmm. And so the crucifixion of Jesus then is his ascent to his throne. So the cross of Jesus is the throne by which he rules the the world going back to john 3 unless one is begotten from above one cannot see the reign of god that is to say you cannot see the crucified jesus as the form and substance of divine government right so god rules by grace and favor and, and all that kind of thing mm -hmm. right or Unless one is begotten of water and spirit, one cannot enter into the reign of God. That's even kind of more spectacular. By way of baptism, we enter into that governance. Hmm. So we are now under the rule of Christ the crucified, 
who is king, right? Hence, in John's gospel, it's true of the synoptics as well, but even more, John's gospel, when he is interrogated by Pilate, the only one question, are you a king? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and Jesus basically answers, yeah, actually I am. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you have the, the, you have the images of his rule. He has a crown, he's given a robe, and he's given a throne, right? And his throne is the cross. Cross, yeah. And so, and so here again, we find the importance of Christ the crucified as the manifestation of the rule of God, right? It is through the crucified that the Father governs his kingdom, mm. right? So, so those uh, the temple uh, is very important, but very much associated with the temple as a place of sacrifice is the cross as this place of exaltation, the place of divine rule mm -hmm. that uh, is so important for John. So I mentioned these three, which kind of serve as a good kind of entree to this text. Uh, Jesus says the new Torah, all that that implies. He is the will, the wisdom of God, the will of God, the intentionality of God, the purpose of God. Mm -hmm. uh, then Jesus as the new, not, not the new, but the eschatological temple where God will dwell salvifically to which all must be brought to receive redemption and enjoy eternal life. And then the cross of Jesus has his exaltation. It's not a humiliation in John. Jesus is not humiliated, or God is not humiliated by way of the cross. Rather, it is the manifestation of divine love, mm -hmm. John 3, 16. In this way did God love the world that he gave, right? So the lifting up of the Son of Man is the manifestation, the form and the substance of divine agape. So when first John says God is love, wow, that wow. I mean, that not only says that the divine that that God loved the world by way of the crucified Jesus, his son, but that that love so manifested characterizes he himself, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we go back to where we began. It's always good to go to the beginning, I suppose. NRK ain't hologos. In beginning was the speech. But this is a reference, this hologos there is a reference to the Gospel of John, right? Not just to his person, mm -hmm. right? It's a reference to the whole narrative of the Logos made flesh. That narrative finds its source in the beginning, which is God, right? And so the cross of Jesus is the manifestation of God such as he is in himself, namely love for the world, right? So John's Gospels... Rather remarkable. Actually. Rather remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good word for this. And this whole conversation has been been remarkable. Um, we've got just, let me just check. We've got maybe five minutes. If you want to take just three minutes and um, as you're talking, you know, you just kind of bask in the beauty of certainly the revelation of God, you know, the gift of a uh, gospel like John, all the intricacies, you know, as you're talking through, it's just, you know, you can't. You have all these areas in the Old Testament to read that shed light on all of these beauties and the depth that's going on in the book of John. Uh, just taking like these themes, how does, if, if people start to see these themes, which often, of course, they're going to miss, um, once they see these themes, how does that affect the modern day Christian as he's orienting his life or her life? Well, that's a really good question. And uh, how should I answer that? Let me let me change your question just a little bit. Mm -hmm. First of all, how does it how does it influence our church's life mm -hmm. okay, rather than the individual? So I'm going to say, first of all, the individual Christian must understand themselves as ecclesial individuals. They're not 
they're not autonomous believers. Right? Mm -hmm. They 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 subsist as Christians within the reality of the church. And so one now must ask the question, in what does the church itself subsist? And here we might just go to Paul that the church is the body of Christ. It's, it's a Eucharistic image. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when the church administers by way of its called an ordained minister, the apostolic preacher administers the Lord's Supper, which of course assumes th the baptism of, of all. Mm -hmm. When he administers, proffers it, gives it over, and the Christian receives it, it is that event in which the church subsists. Hmm. Right? And so I often point out that Strictly speaking, the church does not do the Eucharist, right? It does, it's, it's not something the church does as though it, it's an act. It's not like me and mowing the lawn, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as though I can, I can exist quite happily without mowing the lawn. Right? Mm -hmm. The church subsists in its Eucharistic participation. And so it's by way of the Eucharistic participation that the church itself is manifested, right? And so, uh, and if, I think if we would think this through, and here I'm going backwards through the creed. We tend to think of the creed as first and second and third article. I'm going to go third, second, and first. It's by way of participation in the body and blood of Christ as the church that we celebrate, participate in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was sent into the world to redeem the world, second article, in order that the Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord, might also be our Father, right? And so uh, it, it is kind of uh, perhaps remarkable that one of our post uh post uh, Lord's Supper prayers is prayed to the Father. Hmm. Father, we thank you for this salutary gift, right? Well, why should we pray to the Father, right? In a way, it's, well, why not? It kind of makes sense, right? Well, <laughs> yes, it does make sense, but on this deeper level, mm -hmm. right? And so, so one way in which I think if you appropriate John's message, you're going to insist that your church is a robustly sacramental church, hmm. right? With all that that suggests and connotes and denotes, you're going to have sacramental preaching. You're going to have a, you're not going to be ashamed of the crucifix as an icon. You will have an altar at the be, at the front as kind of the altar of the place of sacrifice, which is the new temple. And so we have this wonderful post-communion hymn, What Shall I Render to the Lord for All His Benefits to Me? And that ends, I shall sacrifice, how does that go? <laughs> sacrifice I, of thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, and where? In the, in, in the courts of, in, in the courts of, how does that go? Uh, in, Is it the courts of the In the courts Lord? of the Lord's house, mm -hmm. in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, right? <laughs> And so by way of that hymn, we are basically saying, voila, right? Festival of Tabernacles again. The church in its Eucharistic assembly and participation is the Ecclesial Festival of Tabernacles, hmm. right? So, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a remarkable text that has actually resonance uh, by way of these themes throughout the history of the church as a history of a sacramental church mm -hmm. of baptism and the Lord's Supper as kind of the telos, right? If I might, and I don't want to offend anybody here, but I kind of wonder about the helpfulness when we speak of the sacraments as means of grace. <coughs> I don't mean that they're not. Mm -hmm. But, but sometimes we kind of speak of them as though they're kind of 
one is the same as another. You know, if we have one, we have both or something like that. It's like you can have chicken or you can have pork on the smorgasbord. <laughs> but there's an economy here. The, the, the reason for baptism was to go to the supper. That was the telos, the goal of baptism. And that's why from the beginning, no one was admitted to the, to the altar who had not gone through the font. Hmm. Right? And of course, there was Old Testament allusion here. The Exodus, he had to go through the waters of the Red Sea in order to get into the wilderness, which led you to the Holy Land. Yeah, there was that topology, but that was sacramentally instantiated in the sacrament of baptism as the necessary entree into the church of God, in which church, as the family of God now, you ate together at his table. Hmm. And so I think it's important that we keep that kind of what I call this economic relationship between baptism and the Lord's Supper in mind. Uh, and, 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 and in many ways, the Gospels, in their very structure, do this. They begin with the baptism of Jesus. All four of them do. All four of them culminate in his passion and resurrection. That really, if we kind of modulate that story into sacramental economy, you have baptism leading to the Lord's Supper. But to go back to our martyr thing, once you are baptized, right, you are bound to the one who is the crucified Jesus, hmm. the crucified Lord. And as one bound by him, you share in his destiny, right? So to quote again from Revelation 2, be steadfast unto death and you shall receive the crown of life. It's, it's, a, it's a good saying. Hmm. Well, I think the, it actually says it. It's a good saying. It is a good saying. <laughs> Dr. Weinrich, professor, uh, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure to be here. This thank was you great. So if you have any willingness, we will certainly have you on. We'll either get you out to Minnesota or we will come back here to Fort Wayne. But if uh, if anyone wanted to learn more from you, what are, what are good places for them to go if they want to learn more about Dr. William Weinrich and the things you've written, things that you've spoken well, to? Well, you know, I... I'm not a car salesman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I might I might mention yeah. that I, I'm writing a commentary on John for mm -hmm. the Concordia Commentary series. Two volumes are now out. The first covers primarily the first six chapters, the second chapters seven through twelve. I'm presently working on the third and final one, which will encompass chapters thirteen to twenty-one. And if you want to read more about what I've kind of tried to articulate here, uh, I try to do it better and more expansively in those volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'd be more than happy if uh, somebody wanted to uh, contact me directly to email, uh, email me. I'd mm -hmm. be happy to receive that email. I'll do the best to respond to them. But... Uh, uh, I suppose <laughs> I suppose by my commentary might be the easiest way. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. <laughs> I've got a lot of markings in there, and I'll go back and try to try to keep drilling it into my mind. So very good. Hey, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Yeah, God bless, and have a good day. Thank you.